Um, last week, we, uh, we gave a little uh, lead into the course by reviewing modernism, modernity, what's mod modernity about? Um, and uh, that train of thought led us to encounter Jackson Pollock. Um, and uh, we talked through Pollock a little bit, uh, and I want to I want to resolve uh, what we said about him. Uh, I mean, not fully resolve, but I want to say a little bit more about Pollock today, and use that as an entrance into um, our talk today, our discussion today. Um, and the thing about Pollock is that it's not really clear how to interpret him. Um, we've already gotten a couple of interpretations. I think pretty divergent interpretations last week. Um, in our review of modernity, we talked about a guy named Clement Greenberg, one of the most prominent um, art critics in the middle of the 20th century. Um, there's actually a book uh, written about Greenberg. What's it called? The Art Czar, something like that. He just had this huge presence uh, during uh, uh, the mid 20th century, huge presence in the art world. Um, and the, uh, the subtitle of that book is something like The Rise and Fall of the Domination of Clement Greenberg over 20th Century Art Criticism or something like that. So he, we'll see some problems and we'll move past Greenberg um, today, later today, this afternoon. But Greenberg uh, provided one of the, I think, strongest interpretations of Pollock, strongest as in forceful, whether you buy into it in the end or not. And Greenberg's train of thought is, is this, purity in art, and that's what he's after, some kind of a logical purity, a, a rational purity, art that is self-reliant and clear, pure. Purity in art consists in the acceptance, the willing acceptance of the limitations of the medium of the specific art. It is by virtue of its medium that each art is unique and strictly itself. So what he's going to do is argue for a really thoroughgoing formalism, right? Where the form is the meaning. He doesn't want all of the other kind of baggage that go, can go along with art and be laden upon art. Things like narrative and reference outside of itself. Art is the painting uh, in particular. Is all, has always just made itself about so many other peripheral things and ignoring the power and the potential of meaning within the medium itself. And so purity, pure, forceful meaning in art is going to acknowledge the limitations of the medium um, in order to restrict itself to the meaningfulness of the medium. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, we we did bring in Harold Rosenberg at the end, and we'll we'll try to sort him out a little bit more. And as we go, we'll we'll get into some pretty strong critiques of Greenberg. But I think I think what I'm trying because I'm uh, in the in this class, we're leaving out loads of really important material, really important artists that we're not even talking about, really important critics that we're not even talking about. But what, what we're hoping to do is, rather than exposing you to sort of everything that's being written or all of the major points of view that's being written and all of the major artists, focus on a few in some depth and then uh, you can use that as you go forward from this class to work out from. Right? So if you know what Greenberg is doing, um, it will be a whole lot easier for you to locate the people who are disagreeing with Greenberg or offering alternatives to Greenberg and so on. I'll give you some of those alternatives, obviously. Some of those pretty harsh critiques of him, but at least for the first week, we're, yeah, we we're focusing in on, on him quite a bit, and we'll, foc we'll continue to focus on him this week. After this week, you won't hear so much about him. Does that kind of address your question? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's one of the difficult things about teaching any kind of history. It's so dense. There's so much. There's so many different ways to 
um, cut through it, or so many different threads you can pull out and say, this is the important thread. Yeah. Yeah? Um, does Pollock mark the end of uh, modern English? Not quite. I, I will argue in this afternoon, we'll try to get to the, the end of modernism, I, what I want to call the end of modernism, where I want to identify it. And that's minimalism. What's that? Yeah. I mean, Pollock is an interesting transitionary figure because he's, he, uh, I mean, according to Greenberg, he's going to be the height of modernism. I mean, he's, he is finally purifying uh, the medium um, and making it self-sufficient and, and, um, and autonomous in a way, clear in a way. He's the height of the modernist progression. Uh, well, we get a few others that we'll talk about this afternoon. Um, but if you, if you listen to other people interpreting Pollock, like Alan Capro, who we'll talk about in a couple weeks, few weeks, um, he's going to say, oh, Pollock opens up, um, he opens up performance art. And performance art is going to be fairly radically unmodern <laughs> in, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, because uh, performance art is going to be so concerned with um, uh, ritual and routine and social norms, not purity at all, um, but social norms. It's going to be very, yeah, socially laden. Does that yeah, answer your question? Yeah. So you can pretty much, in, this, in, in the, the isms labels, um, uh, you, can, you can still locate... Pollock in modernity, modernism. Most, all, everything we're going to talk about today, I, I would argue to, if you have to cut it one way or another, that we're still in modernism um, up through the 60s in some ways. Uh, the following weeks, we're going to reach back and see that post, postmodern thinking is really getting going at the same time in the 50s, and you could probably even go earlier. I mean, Duchamp is kind of the quintessential proto-post-modern uh, artist. Uh, so th there's going to be a lot of overlap. But I think, I think Pollock is still coming through the modernist train of thought. Yeah. Good? OK. Um, so Greenberg's interpretation of Pollock is then going to be, uh, basically, he's going to say, yeah, Pollock is. Um, accepting, willingly accepting the limitations of the medium like no one ever has. He's treating the flatness of the canvas as, a, as an utter flatness, an impenetrable flatness. So much so that uh, he's treating it like an arena that he walks in, that he uh, uh, puts his body into. And his movements in space, his movements with, um, with the paint, um, hit the canvas and go no further. They create no illusion through the canvas. They create no sense of perspective. It hits the canvas and treats it as totally flat. Um, and so uh, Greenberg would say, th this is what Pollock is doing, willingly accepting the limitations of the medium. Um, and in doing so uh, is leading to and helping us to see a deep meaningfulness in the, the medium itself, the resistance of the medium. OK, so that was Greenberg's assessment of Pollock that we talked about last week. And you can certainly see how that would be arguable. You could really argue that from these paintings, that it is pure formalism. There's no illusion. It is paint on canvas, and it is a uh, um, it is solving a lot of the sort of formal problems that painting has been struggling with. For instance, how do you make, how do you put paint on canvas in a way that it doesn't create any sort of spatial depth or spatial illusion, focal points? How do you, how do you subvert all of those conventions of painting that have come up to this point, that have lent painting to representing the world and to illusion, as Greenberg would call it? How do you subvert all of those? How do you withhold those? Well, this is one pretty interesting way. Uh, there is no focal point. 
there's not really a sense, of, there's an extraordinary sense of movement, so he keeps the sense of movement, but it doesn't, you don't focus anywhere. He doesn't lead you anywhere. You just go across this sort of field, this energy field of paint. Uh, these, these, um, these records of movement, records of an artist interacting with the canvas, uh, and you get what is often called an all-over composition. That's a pretty important uh, way of addressing uh, some of the pitfalls of, of the conventions of painting if you're going to move past illusion and representation. So there's no focal point, there's no positive and negative space. I mean, he is really withholding a lot of those conventions of traditional painting. And Pollock says this, he acknowledges this. He says this, my paintings do not have a center, but depend on the same amount of interest throughout the painting. Uh, and, and all of that, I think, could be uh, well interpreted by Greenberg. Um, Um, and I think it leaves you with a kind of a, 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 a present everywhere. I, I'm talking about it as a sort of energy field or an all-over composition in that all of the activity of the painting leads to a kind of present moment where it's all over, even though it's the traces of a lot of movement over time. It, it, what it adds up to is this instant visual effect that has no center and no focal point, no positive space, no negative space, just kind of energetic movement, uh, optical experience. Okay, so fine, that's Greenberg's interpretation of Pollock. But it's not a, it, at all clear that that's the only way to interpret this, nor the way it should be interpreted. Uh, so last week, we also added to that Harold Rosenberg, and Harold Rosenberg's uh, interpretation of what Pollock is doing. And Rosenberg is going to put the emphasis in an entirely different place. He couldn't care less about purity, uh, purity in painting. What he cares about is that the, the aspect of the arena that Pollock creates. That it doesn't have anything to do with purifying painting. It has to do with a, a human person acting and the painting as an action. Uh, a meaningful action. So what Rosenberg uh, is going to lead us to is, uh, um, is this emphasis on American painters, read Jackson Pollock, and there are a few others I'll introduce you to, um, who are treating the canvas as an arena in which to act. It's not a space in which to reproduce or redesign or um, to um, express something or picture something. It's not for picturing. Uh, it's not a picture, but it's an event. It's an action. And you should read that as, uh, hear that as social action, um, individual action. It is um, emotional action, mental action, it's action, uh, human action. It's not about painting and formalism. It's about a, a person asserting himself in, in a way. And Rosenberg goes on, giving a really different reading than Greenberg, saying, a painting that is an act, this kind of action, is inseparable from the biography of the artist. The painting itself is a moment in the adulterated mixture of his life. The act painting, he wants to even and sort of uh, hyphenate them, is of the same metaphysical substance as the artist's existence. The new painting has broken down every distinction between art and life. Now that is not at all what Greenberg wants. <laughs> the, the, Greenberg needs this distance, this critical distance, where the art doesn't refer, it doesn't refer, because if you are winding art and life up together, then you're immediately letting in all of those references, right? Suddenly art, Pollock's painting, is about him, and it's about his life and his struggles, and it's about his uh, this and that and all of those things. Um, what Greenberg doesn't want is the artist living on the canvas. It's way too referential. Um, Rosenberg is going to put all of the emphasis there. Um, and this phrase, this kind of 
union of art and life, the artist living in the work or living on the canvas is something that will, you'll hear in the coming weeks. Um, this, this, it's putting the emphasis on performative meaning rather than formal meaning. Maybe that's a good way of saying it. Greenberg wants us to see meaning in the, the presence of forms, the way forms relate to each other, the way we experience them optically. After the artist makes the work, the artist is irrelevant. It's the form that carries the meaning. What Rosenberg is saying is mm, the form is just a, a kind of um, artifact of the, the artist living on the canvas and living in the, world, in the work and trying to make sense of the world. That's what we read into, the performance. Uh, it's a thoroughly un-Greenbergian thing to say. And so here in Pollock, we have multiple interpretations that we'll find uh, today and in the coming weeks, will shoot off into multiple new works created by other artists. Okay. Um, and I think uh, I just sort of want to um, leave you in that tension uh, and have you sort through what you think of Pollock's work. What is it? What is he doing here? Why is it important? Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think both of them are offering a kind of general interpretation of art, what modern art is, what it means, um, and so it would be a kind of uh, a broad a broad umbrella that they're placing over a lot of different artists. But both of them are primarily talking about what's going on in New York at the time, and. Um, um, Pollock, especially when Rosenberg is writing and when Greenberg is writing later. The earlier essay we saw from Greenberg, uh, Pollock is still, all, all of abstract expressionism is still quite young. It's quite adolescent. But in the essay you read for today and the essay that Rosenberg wrote, Pollock is um, extremely prominent in the New York art scene. So if they're writing about what's going on in um, action painting and um, abstract painting in general, Pollock is, one of, is going to be one of the immediate references, especially with the action painting essay that uh, Rosenberg wrote. Good? Okay. Good. Um, uh, and, and I think uh, this, this difference in their interpretation comes from a different, obviously a different priority, uh, what they want art to do, but also what they see as the problems. For Greenberg, what's the essential problem of painting in the mid 20th century? It's confusion, it's logical confusion. That's how he started our essay from last week, right? A confusion results in the arts, when certain arts are subservient to other arts, like painting subservient to literature, is the example from last week. So it's a logical problem, a kind of a, 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 um, art not doing what it should be doing is the problem. For Rosenberg, it seems like the problem is, cr is a crisis, that the modern artist sp finds himself in some kind of a crisis that has to be encountered and worked through in a new form. And we're gonna see this over and over today. Um, this idea that, th that modern times are unique and so you have to have a new form for addressing it. Um, it's crisis that the artist is acting in the midst of. And uh, Rosenberg says this pretty directly in the essay from last week. He says this, the American vanguard, and that's just anytime you see that term, that is a way of saying avant-garde, right? Uh, rather than saying the American avant-garde, the American vanguard, same word. The American vanguard painter took to the white expanse of the canvas as Melville's Ishmael took to the sea. Ha have any of you read Moby Dick? Who is Ishmael? How would you describe Ishmael in, in the book? Anyone want to offer a, 
description. Yeah, obsessed with hunting the white whale, <laughs> as, as uh, uh, it's often said, spoken. Uh, hunting the white whale, the great white whale that no one can capture. Um, and the white whale in this, in this book ends up being some sort of a symbolic figure, right? Uh, this thing that's lurking in the deep, um, underneath the surface appearance of things, the surface appearance of the ocean, um, and to encounter the whale, you go out onto the, into the deep. You have to go set yourself into the abyss, so to speak, if you're going to encounter this thing. And this thing is, is powerful and mysterious, ghostly. It's the white whale. It's often depicted as this sort of ghostly thing. Um, that is, um, in one way or another, at odds with humanity, antagonistic to humanity. Um, uh, they're, natural, they're natural enemies in one way or another, but at the same time, they're tied together. Uh, that they can't, Ishmael can't break away from his obsession to conquer and defeat the white whale. And, uh, and the white whale seems to kind of go after them in a, in a, in a sense. Um, so what does the white whale symbolize? Is it some, so, something having to do with the modern condition? Is it God? Is it, the, is it a kind of post-Nietzschean, the, the death of God, this lurking, this lurking, haunting thing that you can't quite kill off and you can't quite get over and you're totally obsessed with <laughs> in your hatred of it or whatever it might be. Um, at any rate, you can, you can look into Moby Dick on your own. It's fascinating, fascinating book, a meaningful book. Um, but at any rate, when Rosenberg characterizes the American painter as a kind of Ishmael, what he's talking about is nothing formal. He couldn't care less about formalism here. In fact, he's really violating the whole idea of uh, formalism. Ishmael takes to the sea, the abyss, in mortal, um, obsessive combat with the, the ghostly, um, massive figure haunting the, the deep, right? Uh, the, the American painter takes to the canvas with that sense of urgency and struggle and conflict and crisis, right? Uh, Rosenberg is setting up a different paradigm for us to understand Pollock and um, abstra um, uh, abstract expressionism in general. And he continues that quote to clarify it. On the one hand, what I mean by um, the, comparing the painter to Ishmael, on the one hand, a desperate uh, recognition of moral and intellectual exhaustion. On the other, the exhilaration of an adventure over the depths in which he might find reflected the true image of his identity. Um, so what's tied up into this conflict? Uh, on the one hand, a sort of exhaustion, and on the other, a sense of adventure uh, in which you encounter ultimately yourself. Uh, and this is a frightful, awful, necessary conflict that you find yourself in. And in that context, do you, I mean, do you see that in, in Pollock? Are these, a, is there a sense of crisis in these paintings? A sense of urgency. We talked about the handprints last week. Uh, and a sort of instability, a mark making, a, a kind of a, um, an, an, a responsiveness to the abyss of the canvas. Or, do you read them like Greenberg, where they are formal solutions to the formal problems of painting? What's at stake in these things? Or are they just a kind of playful jazz? They could be read in that way, too. 
that these are dance and they're sort of celebration. Uh, one of the things that happens when we pull back on representation is that the thing opens up to a, a broader possibility for meaning something. And it's not that we're just foisting any interpretations on these. We have to argue the interpretations from what we see, but um, there's a kind of uh, a multiplicity in, in what this might mean and how we might understand this. And that too is going to be important as we move on in the course, that multiplicity. There certainly have been a, a, a several comparisons made uh, 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 or several notes made about the vast expanse of the canvas as an arena, a space in which you act. But it also it feels like a, a kind of mural, a grand statement. It's, the, it, it's painted the size of those great grand machines, as they call them, of French Romantic painting huge, massive paintings of the, the Raft of the Medusa, for instance, a painting about crisis, crisis of uh, individuals in the modern era, in the modern state, abandoned by the state, and so on, on the abyss, once again, and he paints at that sort of scale, just does so with a totally different um, visual language. It also, uh, probably is even more directly related to the grand statements of someone like Picasso, who is dealing, uh, is, is making the grand paintings, um, but is uh, also making them in this new modernist language that acknowledges the flatness of the picture plane and still uses that picture plane to talk about, speak about some kind of crisis going on in the 20th century Western world, whether that's the crisis of World War I, the crisis of Guernica, or the crisis that's immediate to, world, uh, to uh, Jackson Pollock, World War II. There's a darkness, a, an angst. And Pollock uh, could certainly be argued as taking up the cubist grid, the cubist construction of this modern anguish, and uh, uh, swallow, it's, it's been talked about as Pollock swallows the cubist grid and throws up a web or a network. So rather than still picturing, I mean if Picasso is using this grand scale to picture something about the crisis of the modern age um, and, and modern man and so on, devastation of the human spirit and so on. Um, if that's what Picasso is doing, he's still using pictorial language, even though he's really acknowledging the flatness of the canvas. Perhaps what Pollock is doing is trying to in paint in the same way about similar subject matter and a similar crisis, but uh, uh, refuse the pictorial um, operations of the painting altogether. So what do you have left? If you don't have picturing, a picturing of the crisis, what do you have left? You have this urgent kind of action, this urgent kind of response to this flat picture plane. <laughs> Is that a, a reasonable interpretation of Pollock? So, um, um, so we've got these multiple kind of readings going of Pollock that force us to clarify what we think about them. Are they pure formalism or a pure kind of expressionism? Are they playful in the manner of dance and jazz? Are they formal in the manner that Greenberg is talking about? Or is, are they a sense of, do they exude a sense of crisis, aggression, fighting even? Are they ordered or are they chaotic? Are they stable, or are they incredibly fragile, and so on and so forth? Um, Pollock makes it huge uh, in 1949 or so. You can kind of locate it about that time. Um, he has the Life magazine article published about him that, um, 
uh, and he is he's having major shows at major museums and galleries um, and this for he, he allows a photographer some of these photographs that I've showed you are from a photographer that he allowed to come into his studio and photograph him and for a variety of reasons Pollock just sort of went into his if he was in crisis before he went into a more of a personal crisis with regards to painting after this sort of major success uh, in 1950 he starts as, he starts introducing titles again in ways that he, he had pulled them away as we looked at last week and the paintings start to kind of break down in a lot of ways. Uh, and there's a lot of disagreement about what happens to Pollock in the 50s. But they seem much less patient, <laughs> if, the, if you can say that, uh, much more agitated. And he reintroduces the um, mark making directly on the canvas. So there are brush strokes, there are pin strokes. Uh, he's drawing on the canvas. And he starts introducing imagery again. Um, so that this, uh, by 1953, you have full-on titles, Portrait and a Dream. Uh, and one could ask which is which. Um, uh, but there are recognizable things going on. Face, some sort of... Uh, uh, there's recognizable imagery there. Some sort of a, 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 a nude woman having something going on, whether it's birth or something violent, maybe a violent birth. Um, we, get, we get imagery going on in this kind of agitated way, uh, really agitated composition in a way, the all over composition that does seem awfully kind of harmonious and um, well-structured that we saw before is, is, is sort of uh, breaking down into, into this. It's kind of a hideous painting, isn't it? <laughs> that was too editorial. Um, and he goes back, he goes back to uh, a, the kind of all over composition he he brings it back and this time he is he's uh, painting on the canvas with brush so it's a kind of combination of splatter and brush strokes and the paint gets very thick and very dense this is a a a detail of it this is called white light but there seems to be something quite wrong um, in the sense that he only made two paintings uh, during um, uh, during this year, is that true? They're few, any, anyway, uh, fairly few. Uh, that certainly could be reflected in that there's a lot of time uh, invested into this painting. Um, but there, there also seems to be a, a, a kind of um, instability in him in a way. The paintings keep looking very different from each other, one after the next, um, even though there aren't all that many coming um, so he's not seeming to work through ideas. And in 55, he only makes two paintings. I'm quite sure about that. And this is one of them. This is perhaps the last painting that he made that is an, is an interesting painting, still dealing with this kind of all over composition, but it sort of feels like he's not really sure where to go. Um, and at the, at the uh, same time, his own life is fairly chaotic in, in a lot of ways. He has all sorts of strife with his um, wife, Lee Krasner, who's a, a very interesting painter that you should uh, make yourself aware of. Um, and he had been struggling with alcoholism for most of his adult life, and it really amped up uh, during this period of time. Um, and he was, he was having sort of flings, affairs, and was do, uh, doing all sorts of fairly erratic behavior. Um, and in, by 56, he doesn't make any paintings uh, um, for the entire year. And, and then in August of 56, is involved in this single car, car crash in which the car he's driving runs into a tree and kills him 
and kills um, his girlfriend, I believe. Uh, and there's one other person in the car who survived, was injured. Um, but he kind of, he kind of, there's something, there's something going on in, in Pollock that doesn't just, I mean, maybe it's a sort of pure formalism. Um, but there seems to be a kind of crisis in him all the way along that is wound up in the painting, maybe lending a little bit more um, credence to Rosenberg's interpretation of, of what he's doing. Um, so what do we make of Pollock? What do we make of him? Um, he uh, at one point said this, and I think this is a very interesting quote and a good quote to end on, uh, end our discussion of Pollock on. And he says this, the strangeness of modern art, he's acknowledging its strangeness and its, its kind of distance, its remoteness from um, most people, the way most people think about art and see art. The strangeness will wear off It'll happen. It has happened. Modern art is being taught in uh, sort of every university art department, art history class of the 20th century. The strangeness has worn off. I mean, they're still strange, but they're, they're part of the art history canon, the institution now. The strangeness will, will wear off. And I think we'll discover the deeper meanings in modern art once the strangeness wears off. What kind of deeper meanings is he talking about? What is the after? Um, uh, is it, is it, this seems to suggest, I, th I think, that um, there is more at stake in modern art than philosophical questions, the problem of painting. There seems to be something pretty human at stake or urgent um, at stake. Um, and I think we can get a, a better idea of what these deeper meanings of modern art might be if we um, uh, move on and consider a couple more of the artists that are involved in this movement. Before we move past Pollock, any comments, questions? Okay. So I want to couple uh, uh, Pollock with Mark Rothko. And as with Pollock, uh, you should assign Rothko the rough date of 1950. Obviously, his working career extends much far beyond that. But when Rothko is important to our narrative here in this class is about 1950. And Rothko is a is a, a fascinating guy. He's born in Russia, uh, lives there until about the age of 10. He is um, born um, into a, a fairly, I, I think we'd say a fairly secular Jewish family. Um, his, his father was uh, very bright and very um, uh, well educated and educated his children um, in philosophy and politics much more so than in religion, <laughs> Jewish, Jewish theology, and so on. Um, uh, when he's 10, because things, it, it, it's, you know, in 1913 and kind of leading up to that, um, there is all sorts of uh, difficulty, struggle going on in Europe. Europe is ramping up towards world war. And... Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, so there is a, a pretty strong immigration of uh, Russian Jews, especially, um, uh, to the United States, and that includes Rothko's family. He's, uh, his given name is Marcus Rothkowitz, um, very Jewish uh, name. Um, and eventually, he would shorten it uh, uh, right around World War II when there was kind of, uh, well, actually, before World War II, it's in the 30s, um, when there's all sorts of concerns. Nazi, Nazism is going on, and there are a variety of sort of anti-Semitic sentiments going on here and there and in the United States and certainly in Europe. Um, and so he 
like a, I think a lot of Jews at the time, end up altering their names so it's not qu quite so telling <laughs> or uh, not quite so uh, um, Jewish sounding, uh, I guess is how it's often said. So he shortens his name to Mark and goes by Rothko rather than Rothkowitz. And this is one of Rothko's paintings. Um, and this is pretty, this is uh, also often categorized as abstract expressionism, that the sort of two largest figures in the abstract expressionist movement are Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko. This doesn't really look anything like Pollock's work though, right? I mean, if Pollock is abstracting for the sake of pure activity, if that is what he's doing, uh, Rothko does something really different. There's very little activity here. I mean, uh, certainly not the gestural kind of um, motion that Pollock is uh, painting with. Uh, this, these seem to be hazy blocks of color on top of a color. Um, they seem very stable, not gestural. They seem to be very formal um, in their own way. So we have to make a distinction with an abstract expressionism, and this is a common distinction to make. There's something that ties these together. They're working in the same time period. They know each other. They are, are kind of often categorized under the same label, even though they would, in varying ways, refuse it. Rothko didn't want to be called an abstract expressionist. Um, uh, but I think there's enough going on here, uh, enough commonality to link them, whether you call it abstract expressionism or something else, but we'll use the kind of canon. These are the typical categories. Within abstract expressionism, there's a distinction often made between action painting, which is, uh, which uh, Pollock quintessentially is, and color field painting, which Rothko quintessentially is. Um, in Pollock, color doesn't play that big of a role. Rather, it's the priority of gesture and activity. Um, with Rothko, gesture and activity is mostly withheld or subdued, and you get color, simple color forms doing all of the work, most of the work. OK, so we'll make that distinction. And I want to, since I'm not going to talk about um, these artists, I'm going to focus primarily on Pollock and Rothko. I do want to gesture towards uh, the other artists that are often included under the abstract expressionist title so that you can look them up for your own understanding and perhaps for your papers. Lee Krasner is Pollock's wife. Um, Willem de Kooning is a fascinating painter, but we just don't have time to talk about him. Elaine is his wife, and then on down the line. You read, uh, your reading for today uh, included Robert Motherwell. Is Robert Motherwell an, uh, an action painter? I don't know. <laughs> So these are some action painters that you can, you can look up and familiarize yourself with. And I also want to uh, point you towards some other color field painters that you can be aware of. So these are all action painters? Uh, action, yeah. In differing ways. They're all doing something a little different, but they could all be loosely associated with action painting. Some of them coming a little earlier or a little later than Pollock. You got them? Moving on? Almost. All right. Uh, in color field painting, uh, a few other painters that you can be aware of. 
Is Robert Motherwell a color field painter? I don't know. <laughs> if so, there's not a whole lot of color. He seems to be a black and white color paint, a color field painter. Or an action painter that seems to really care about the, the colorful forms of black and white gray. Again, some of these come a little earlier or a little later, but they're mostly all contemporary. We'll talk a bit more about Ad Reinhardt, Helen Frankenthaler this afternoon. All right, you got them? No. <clears throat> and these have these two these two ways of painting have two different looks to them, but they've got it's not just a look, it's not just a superficial difference. They've got they're two ways of organizing a response. If 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 abstract expressionism does have an expressionistic uh, component to it, with that, which I think it does. Um, these are two different ways of organizing that expression and that response. Okay, let's look at Rothko. Let's, uh, let's get into Rothko a little bit and try to understand him. Earlier Rothko um, does, he is, he's painting scenes, subway scenes, he's painting um, uh, people, figures, those sort of things. But you already get the sense here that he, he doesn't so much care about the figures or what he's painting. Right? I mean, already you have a real strong prominence of the grid structure, no interest in kind of individual identities of the people being pictured, and this kind of br brush stroke, brush work that um, sort of uh, withholds clarity, I suppose. That it, it's like sort of fuzzy forms meeting up against each other. Um, is there any? Anything to read into the kind of, if this is a modern landscape painting in a way, or genre painting in a way, it's very grid oriented and feels fairly cagey, right? It feels tight, feels, uh, it feels um, like a grid, like you're living in a grid. And perhaps there's some comment going on there that lines up with comments he'll make later on. Um, he also, like Pollock is extremely interested in um, surrealism, European surrealism, and in um, uh, psychotherapy, right? So uh, we talked about last week Pollock being interested in the work of Carl Jung and dreams and how they reveal archetypes and those sort of things, right? Um, Rothko is interested in the same sort of things and he's making paintings um, that are related to that, especially in the late 30s, early 40s, up to the mid 40s, really. Um, and so Rothko would talk about something like this, which is the omen of the eagle. And you've got 1942. I mean, what's going on in 1942? War. Yeah. Europe is totally uh, uh, kind of. Um, in the, in the um, midst of war, deeply in the midst of war, and the United States is getting into it, launching into it. So you have these m kind of massive countries, world powers in conflict with each other, and um, perhaps we read the eagle, the sign of the eagle, as symbolic, representative of those, those uh, states, those political powers. The eagle is very commonly associated with the United States, but uh, various empires uh, in the past and various um, political powers in the past. So Rothko would talk about this as, in one way or another, being an archetypal image in which man and bird and beast and tree merge into a single tragic idea. Oh. <laughs> Is that the portrait of a, of a state? 
an empire, a, uh, a man, bird, beast, and tree merged into a single tragic idea. Already it's important to see that in Rothko, tragedy is going to be really important in his language and even in his um, painting. He'll go in the 40s, mid 40s, increasingly towards a kind of surrealist language, um, pulling up, trying to get at dreams and archetypes that in, in one way or another are oriented around um, drama, a specifically tragic uh, drama. And, and so why the surrealist bent? Why is, he, why is he pulling back from representation as much as he is? It could have something to do with this increasing formalist um, conversation that's going on with people like Greenberg and others. Um, but when Rothko talks about his pulling away from representation, he seems to come at it from a different angle. He says this, if I have faltered in the use of familiar objects, it's because I refuse to mutilate their appearance for the sake of an action which they are too old to serve. <laughs> Representation as a mutilation. Um, some might respond that you're mutilating even more <laughs> by doing this. Anyway, um, or for which perhaps they've never been intended. Um, so I pull away from representing familiar objects uh, in order to not mutilate them and put them into service of things they weren't intended to um, serve. Gradually, he'll pull away from representational imagery altogether. And this happens as with Pollock in 1947, roughly. This move towards total abstraction. 47 is when Pollock pulls his brush off the canvas and begins the drip paintings. Rothko uh, uh, starts withholding imagery altogether and moves to the number, uh, the numbering system or the untitled or the lack of a provocative title which have been present in all of his other paintings up to this point. And these um, paintings gradually start getting simpler. And they seem like, it, with the previous ones, they seem to have been drawn on the canvas and painted, or painted as a sort of drawing, with a drawing priority, getting the grid right, getting the figures um, to work out. Here, it seems to be the application of broad, colorful brush strokes, swaths. And he's intentional about this. He says this, the fact that one usually begins with drawing is already too academic. We start with color, is what he says. And he likes to talk about we. <laughs> he's, he's part of a movement and believes very deeply in, in what he's doing. Um, in opposition to uh, Pollock, perhaps, or in distinction to Pollock, he's removing the gesture as well. And the paintings gradually get simpler and simpler in their compositional structure. They gradually become all vertical. All of them will go vertically. And they gradually then, within that verticality, start uh, achieving this kind of stacking of horizontal rectangles. Until by the uh, late 40s, 49, some in 48, you get this, which is once again vertical orientation, which is usually the orientation of the person, a portrait, right? You paint portraits of people, vertical. That's the human orientation. Landscapes are, are horizontal. They uh, coordinate themselves with the horizon, the landscape. So he's painting vertical compositions, and we have to, I think, insist on that because he does it over and over and over again and, and never uses horizontals until much later for a long series of them. But it's always vertical, but within that vertical frame is always horizontal bands and horizontal blocks. There's something about those two going together that's really important to him. What is it? How is he engaging the orientation of the human figure upright with the 
orientation of the horizontal landscape and combining them in each of these compositions. Now, just as with Pollock, we've got some pretty divergent uh, interpretations that we could associate with Rothko. After all, you could definitely go back to Greenberg and explain what Rothko is doing pretty easily um, uh, using Greenberg's train of thought. Purity in art consists in the acceptance, willing acceptance of the limitations of the medium. What is Rothko doing? Really accepting those limitations. The flat canvas, he's just going to work with simple things like uh, verticality and horizontality and color um, and get powerful results just from those few working um, pieces, those few moving pieces. And Rothko's own language does seem to um, signify this in some ways. Um, he says things like this. We, once again, and he's, uh, in this case he's writing with some other artists, including Motherwell, who are responding to a bad critique that they got, <laughs> a, bad, a bad review, rather. Uh, we favor the simple expression of concrete thought. We are for the large shape because it has the impact of the unequivocal. We wish to reassert the picture plane. We are for flat forms because they destroy illusion and reveal truth. Ooh, that's <laughs> interesting. Uh, it's very Greenbergian, um, this particular statement. But it also points to the fact that all, uh, so sometimes we uh, look at abstraction and we say it's, this, it's just not about anything. It's not, you know, you're not saying anything, or so on and so forth. What Rothko is saying, no, no, no. Uh, what we're after is truth. <laughs> and we think that you can only get to the truth by destroying the illusions, the sort of mirror maze that painting has become. Smoke and mirrors that represent this and this and tell these stories and uh, do so through illusion. We reveal truth by acknowledging the truthfulness of the object that we encounter, the flat canvas, and responding to it in ways that are faithful to its flatness and, and what it can do. And we reveal truth in the, in the meantime. So you could certainly um, interpret Rothko in terms of Greenberg in that way. I think you could also uh, go a step further with Greenberg. Last week we talked about how Greenberg, in his argument, he's eventually going to say, um, you know what painting should do? It should pay attention to how music works. How does music work? It doesn't sort of clutter things up with um, references and with lyrics and all of that stuff, not good music. And, in uh, Greenberg's vernacular. Um, rather, it moves you powerfully just by organizing purely abstract form, pitches and rhythms, compressions and expansions of sound, right? Look to music and you'll figure out how painting can behave in a purely formal way. And if you use that kind of analogy or that um, that comparison to music, Rothko's paintings do make quite a bit of sense, right? They sort of operate in, analogously to uh, music as a series of, as like a chord, right? A musical chord. They hum in different pitches. Um, uh, some of them very kind of tight and piercing, others of them very expansive and warm, and, and there's a kind of musical chord that just hums. I think that's a, a, a pretty wonderful way to look at these. Not so that you're literally hearing music, although that might be interesting. We call that, what, uh, um, synesthesia multiple senses working together. And certainly Kandinsky uh, was interested in synesthesia, actually hearing things when you look at paintings. Both Kandinsky, it was orchestra. I mean, what, what Kandinsky was painting was, um, you know, Stravinsky. <laughs> uh, what Rothko is doing is more like a medieval Gregorian chant. 
all together just held. And I think that's, that's quite compelling. They're, they're humming musical chords in a way. Not so that it's mimicking music, but it's doing, it's operating analogously to the way that music can operate as pure, powerful form. We'll see some of these next week. Not these particular ones, but we'll see some of his paintings. And they are, they, they are powerful visual experiences. Um, and a lot of those paintings are, if we think about them as kind of musical chords that hum, they're extremely beautiful. I mean, uh, much of his work is, uh, I think, extremely beautiful, extremely sensitive layering of colors. And there's been a lot of research done about lately about exactly what kind of materials he was using. It's, it's uh, not what we expected it to be. He's using all sorts of other things in there, egg and uh, wax and various resins and things like that that we weren't aware of until they started doing chemical samples. Um, so they're, they're very beautiful, they're very um, sophisticated color combinations, but there's also this pervasive darkness in his paintings. If they're kind of like musical chords, some of them are pretty dissonant. <laughs> They, uh, uh, there's a, there's a, a kind of yawning darkness that appears in a lot of them, um, in the center of them sometimes. The spaces, and, and it, we could think of them as musical chords, we could also think of them as kind of spaces that advance and recede in a way. Um, that some colors just tend to come forward and some recede, and there seem to be fairly dark uh, passages in his paintings that recede into a kind of abyss, if you will. Maybe that's a legitimate way to read those black spaces, maybe not. Um, but one's suspicions that that's the case, that there's this pervading darkness in the work, seems to be reinforced when you actually listen to what Rothko is saying. I quoted him before as being per using pretty formalist language, but if you go on and you continue to hear him talk, he says things like this. A clear preoccupation with death permeates my work. The only valuable subject matter in painting are the tragic and the timeless. <laughs> Ooh, he, uh, once again, uh, it doesn't seem like he is talking about formalism and just trying to get colors to move back and forth and make pretty things. Uh, that's not, I think, what he is after at all. Um, and not, I, I just equated formalism with prettiness. You don't have to do that. That's, don't accept that. <laughs> but he's not trying to do either of those, I, th I think pure formalism that's just an optical experience. If it is an optical experience, a purely formal experience, it has to go in, it has to launch us into experiences of tragedy or timelessness, or as he says here, death, which might touch on both of those, the both incredibly tragic and the timeless in a way. Yeah, Brooke. Uh, can you that yeah, sure. A clear preoccupation with death permeates my work. Actually, the permeates my work comes earlier. So I, I, it's, it, yeah. Permeated throughout my work is something like, it uh, goes like that, a clear preoccupation with death. And then a second quote. The only valuable subject matter are the tragic and the timeless. Yeah, Amy. Dif yeah, different media. Pollock, um, Pollock used a variety of things. Uh, I mean, there's, in some of his paintings, there's all sorts of junk in there, uh, just stuff like 
coins and cigarettes and things like that. Um, but he, he also uh, tended to use house paint, especially early on, big cans of house paint, which is one reason why when you see a Pollock now, they're not looking all that good because house paint isn't all that durable. It was more so then. And I think he's using oil-based house paint, but he's not using it out of tubes. He has, I mean, he, he does some of that as well. I th I'm pretty sure Rothko is almost all oil, but as I said before, he evidently mixed it with all sorts of things to try to get it to dry faster. <laughs> and in fact, actually, I don't even know off the top of my head when acrylic paint was invented. I don't know if they could have gotten acrylic paint at this point. Lauren, do you know, do you know that? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it was later. By the way, Lauren Baker, the chair of our department is here. It's good to have you here. <laughs> I could have introduced you earlier. Um, okay, so we get with Rothko this, this him talking, that, well, these dark passages opening up in the paintings and a kind of coloristic dissonance that happens in the paintings. Um, and we get him talking about death and tragedy a lot. Here's a few details just so you can get right up close, get your nose in it. And the paintings do seem to progressively get darker, maybe deeper in a way, more simple, more is withheld so that uh, forms are somewhat withheld um, in that even w you get very simple shapes, but even those shapes don't have clear edges. There's something about these edges, uh, the shapes not even being clearly defined. They, they then tend to float or, uh, in a way. They tend to be not locked down. But then he starts, I think, withholding even more color um, so that they get, they get darker. There's more withheld. And again, you can read loads from Rothko, um, um, and he is, uh, his language continues to reiterate this sort of, there's a darkness going on here. He, he talks about this, here's a quote. Um, the exhilarated tragic experience is for me the only source of art. Um, and he believed that, uh, that the the task of the modern painter is to um, enact tragedy and to kind of help help uh, a, a culture, a society deal with its own uh, tragedy, its own sense of lostness, difficulty, and you and specifically the lostness that he uh, locates in um, our culture, the culture in mid 20th century America, anyway was a culture that had, in which all of its images and its myths and its um, languages had been thrown into default. And I want to sort that out more. What, is, what does he mean by that? Um, what is he talking about? Um, I want to give you a couple more uh, quotes that might help sort through this. My interest is, as he said, um, my interest is only in expressing basic human emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, doom, and so on. The people who weep before my pictures are having the same religious experience I had when I painted them. And if you, as you say, are moved only by their color relationship, then you miss the point. <laughs> uh, there are so many interesting things going on in this quote. Um, first, what he's after in his painting is what's basic to human experience and uh, human emotion. And for Rothko, even though he includes ecstasy in there, his emphasis is almost always going to be on tragedy and doom, I think, uh, when he talks about it. And ecstasy happens sort of in spite of the, or maybe in the, midst of the tragedy and doom. And I think, once again, it's important to situate him historically. He, he is 
he has experienced quite a bit of tragedy and doom. Um, uh, was very in touch with it from his time in Russia and had an ongoing sense of kind of alienation or, or isolation in a way, not fitting um, even, even while in the United States. As the United States is entering wars with Europe and Europe seems to be caving in on itself, destroying itself. So those emotions, those basic human emotions are uh, operating at a higher volume at this time, I think. So we have to understand it in that context. But then he starts to talk about his paintings and he continues to talk about them as religious experiences. They come out of a religious experience and if you, if you are to experience them truly, I think he would say, it's going to be a religious experience that you have. And this um, ties into uh, your first reading for today by Robert Motherwell, where he's talking about the modern painter's world or the world of the modern painter. And basically his argument is that um, at, towards the end is that what art has to do is it has to be religion for people whose religion has collapsed and whose religious meaning and religious symbols and religious ideas are in default. You know what the word default means? When you don't pay your student loans, they go into default. That's bad. <laughs> they, become, they become bankrupt. They become useless. They become a sort of void. And then there's this ongoing um, kind of theme with a lot of these painters, including Rothko, that, the, that what has happened in the modern world is a defaulting of, the, of spiritual and religious symbols and beliefs, um, that they are thrown into crisis. And the, the religion of the age is a kind of dehumanizing scientific technology that uh, allows us to destroy each other well and allows us to control each other well and those sort of things. And it cuts up uh, our experience into categories and classifications and genus and species and all of those things. And it, um, it makes authentic spiritual um, human existence impossible, right? And the problem is that uh, it's the images that have, have gone into default. They no longer carry power in, in the way that they used to. Uh, the, the, the images, the religious images, no longer carry the power that they did. So how do you get at this religious experience? How do you revive this authentic spirituality in people? You have to do it by somehow withholding the images. You can't keep working through the through the same old images and try to revive them. Um, so uh, one might understand his paintings as a kind of imageless icon, that they're intended to specifically be drained of their representations. And you are supposed to, I think, encounter the, the absence of the representation. What are you looking at? You're looking at an, an emptiness. <laughs> Does that make sense? Uh, where something used to reside and no longer does. And that absence, that yearning, that longing for, for God to appear or for the gods to appear, or whatever, however he would have put that. The yearning for the gods to appear is the religious experience. If you feel yearning when you look at these paintings, and a sense of absence and void, then you're having the experience that he had when he painted them. I think, I think that's how we can argue that. Um, and just to kind of put him in historical context, um, I, you'll see in the Motherwell essay and in um, Rothko's 
essay I included in your course pack. It's not part of the assigned readings, but it's a, a short essay called The Romantics Were Prompted. They, they keep talking about the romantics, romanticism. Romanticism is where they come from, these, these uh, particular painters. And uh, romanticism, German romanticism specifically, was all about encountering that, that abyss, that depth, the thing that you can't get your hands around and you can't control through scientific uh, or technological advance. The thing that uh, persistently eludes your grasp. And that thing that eludes the grasp is what uh, we have traditionally referred to as the sublime. Have you heard that word before? In modernity, wherever. That the sublime we can define as that which is simultaneously beautiful and terrifying in the ways that it exceeds our grasp and our control. So in romantic painting, in Friedrich specifically, you have figures who are dwarfed by an overwhelming expanse that they have no control over. They can peer out at it and they can witness it, but they can't control it. And that is the sublime, the thing that, the unspeakable, that which is beyond comprehension and control. And Friedrich does that better than anyone, I think. The monk by the sea is a, once again, a religious figure having a religious experience. And where is he having it? He's having it in front of the deep under the deep. It's peering into the deep, the vast expanse. That might bring us back around to um, Captain Ahab <laughs> that uh, uh, Rosenberg was um, referring us to. And sometimes the sublime is terrible. Notice the boat. Sometimes the sublime undoes us in its um, being ungraspable. When you get to uh, Rothko, however, he's not he, maybe we could say he's a romantic painter, he's after the same kind of experience, but he just thinks that you can't do it by representing nature anymore. Because nature is something different in the mid-20th century than it was in the 19th century. Nature really was uh, kind of unexplainable in a way, or much less explainable, much less controllable. By the 20th century, we do have a considerable more control and explanation for how nature works. We think we do. And we are, in fact, devastating it <laughs> very often. We're more danger to it than uh, it, it appears to be to us. And if that's the case, then how does Rothko get at that same kind of uh, trajectory of romantic painting? What does he do? If you can't do it through representational landscape painting, nature, or the unconscious, which is what the surrealists tried to do and what he did for the early part of his career. He eventually dissociates himself from the surrealists, says that, that's a dead end. What do you do? You, you withhold it. You have to withhold it. You have to somehow make a painting that prompts uh, um, experience, powerful experience, and these are visually powerful things. It has to be powerful enough to prompt that experience, but in its power to, to not give you anything to look at in a way. That, uh, at least not a representational object. We have remnants of landscape in that we kind of have horizon lines, maybe multiple horizon lines, but nature can't be depicted, so the idea goes. Uh, Arthur Danto, who's a well-known art critic writing today, had, uh, wrote this about Rothko. He said, under the Hudson River School, which is American romantic painting, uh, somewhat similar to Friedrich, under the Hudson River School metaphysics, natural and artistic beauty were entirely of a piece, as Kant had believed. Their landscapes delivered the kinds of meaning nature itself did when it was beautiful. A beautiful landscape painting means the same thing as a beautiful landscape, is what he's saying. 
One main difference between those painters and ourselves is that we cannot believe in transcendent beings who address humanity through the media of volcanoes and cascades anymore. So for just that reason, a painting today done as realistically as a Hudson River school landscape could not convey to us the meanings Kant believed natural beauty was designed to transmit. And so Rothko withholds and negates the landscape, leaving us only this. And this idea of our language kind of being in default, our religious language being in default, it, that you can't use landscape, you can't use crucifixes, you can't do any of those things. They have in many ways emptied out of meaning by the mid 20th century, uh, so the thought goes. Um, saying more about that, he says this, without monsters and gods, art cannot enact our drama. Art's most profound moments express this frustration. When they were abandoned as untenable superstitions, namely the monsters and gods, art sank into melancholy. It became fond of the dark and enveloped its objects in the nostalgic intimations of a half-lit world. You get where, you get where Rothko's coming from? You have the strong sense of the dark, the absent, the place where the God used to be and he's no longer there and somehow encountering that absence leads us, to the, leads us to the kind of religious experience, the longing for God to come back or to, to, to show up again. Okay, um, let me see, just a couple more things and then we'll break for lunch. And we'll probably finish off Rothko a little bit at the, uh, at the second half of class. So in the context of the sublime romantic landscape painting, perhaps we could talk about Rothko's painting as being an attempt, being an attempt to speak the unspeakable, to gesture towards the unspeakable, the undefinable, the thing that eludes rational categories and grasp, which I think is one reason he doesn't put edges on this thing. He doesn't even want you to refer to geometry he wants a landscape as stripped down as possible. So there's not a geometry, there's maybe a horizon line, but nothing, nothing else except color forms that appear, present themselves. We've got some enthusiastic studying going on upstairs. Are you doing this kind of drama? <laughs> it would seem like it, huh? <laughs> well, um, Maybe I won't say a few more things. Maybe we'll break for lunch after all. Um, I, I want to leave us, I, I want to show you one more image and then uh, we'll come back and pick it up second, second half of class. The paintings get very dark, as I said. Um, maybe not all the way to the end of his life. There's some disagreement about that, um, but um, they get very dark. I think Robert Hughes, who's another art critic, says it well. He says this, in an age of iconography, Rothko might have been a major religious artist, but he didn't live in such an age. So what is he? Maybe he's a major religious artist who's not an iconographer. <laughs> or maybe he is an iconographer of the modern age. This kind of um, post-Nietzschean, um, death of God, tragic world. Uh, is, I think, I think the kind of train of thought. Um, and after the break, we'll look at uh, one more set of works by Rothko that kind of holds together this, this argument or this suggestion that he's essentially a religious painter um, uh, with uh, the paintings that he did for what's called the Rothko Chapel. It's in Houston, Texas. And uh, and what you see uh, are very large, very dark paintings in which almost everything has been withheld except dark color. Um, in what way is this a chapel and uh, serving as a chapel? Yeah. Uh, 
a secular prophet. Um, I, th I think that could certainly be argued. Yeah, I I'd entertain the argument. I don't know if I would, uh, I don't, I don't know if I would, uh, I don't know if I'd say that so definitively, or at least I would qualify it in a lot of ways by what I meant by prophet and what I meant by secular and those sort of things. But he certainly, that's how he would view himself, and he's certainly functioning that way for a lot of writers. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.